Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our presentation of From Mountains to Sea, Maryland's Natural Areas. We are excited to have you all, and we do miss having you in the branches. We hope we can all get back to normal soon. My name is Mary Duchelle, and I work at the Linthicum branch of the Anne Arundel County Public Library. Uh, today for our presentation, we'll be using the Q&A feature if you happen to want to ask questions. So uh, please type your question into that and Katie and I will um, ask them as time allows. For our program today, I would like to welcome Carrie Wixted from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, Wildlife and Heritage Service. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you, Mary. I'm really excited to be here. And good morning, everybody. I hope you're having a fantastic day. So hopefully you all can see my screen. I'm uh, really excited to talk to you today about a project that I worked on several years ago, and it's called Maryland Natural Areas from Mountains to Sea. My name is Carrie Wickstead, and I work with the Wildlife and Heritage Service within the Department of Natural Resources. So in the overall umbrella of the department, we manage the state's wildlife resources, the ducks and the bucks and everything else in between. And we're primarily hunted, funded by hunting licenses and excise taxes on firearms, even though we do so much more than, uh, than just with hunting. So let's start off with a quick poll. And I think KT has, um, has the poll queued up. And I want to know how many people have heard of Maryland Natural Area. So have you visited one? Um, have you heard of them before, but haven't visited one and have no idea and that's why you're here. So <laughs> if you can't see the poll, uh, feel free to type in the chat and that way I can see it. So, so why don't you fill that out? Heard but not visited. See some folks can't see the poll. Yeah, not all, all versions of Zoom can see the poll. So that's why you can type in the chat. So I see some folks have heard of it before. And yes. Awesome. Well, um, KT, you can end that chat. Let me just see the breakdown. Ooh, looks like over half of you have uh, have heard of natural areas and have visited, and um, and there are about 26% who haven't heard of them. So awesome! So hopefully, I will uh, I will be able to help you find some cool natural areas to visit and give you some new ideas. And for those of you who visited natural areas, maybe I'll I'll share with you some information about new places that you can visit. So I'm going to take you um, through the process of how we design the Maryland Natural Areas Program. And then I will literally take you from mountains to sea, from the furthest reaches of Maryland out in Garrett County, all the way down to the eastern shore of Assateague Island. So let's get started. So in the beginning, there was Dave Franker. He's one of my coworkers. He's our central region ecologist and raptor biologist. And that's him there with the goshawk. Dave Brinker grew up in Wisconsin and he found his love of nature because his mother always took him to Maryland or to Wisconsin natural areas. And so that was his big connection. That was their time um, as a family to go out and explore and learn about these different natural areas and why they're so awesome. And so when he came to Maryland as a graduate student in the 80s, he was really surprised that we didn't have a natural areas ed program at all. And actually we didn't have a natural programs uh, areas program until 2012 when he really got the ball rolling and said, hey, I've been here for over 30 years. We really need to get this going. And as you can see from the map, Maryland was in a sea of, of different states that have natural areas. So we were really behind the curve. So we wanted to designate these natural areas to get people outside. Um, and uh, as you might know, there's a growing disconnect with the natural world and all of that. So we wanted to get people connected to some of these really cool places. And we wanted folks to enjoy Maryland's natural heritage. So we tried to select sites that, that we thought were unique and interesting um, and that 
you could use to to experience America in miniature, aka Maryland. <laughs> so we wanted to recognize unique natural areas. And we also wanted to follow this with our Maryland State Wildlife Action Plan, aka the SWAP. So this is kind of our guiding document for part of this natural areas program, but also uh, looking at, at species of greatest conservation need and key wildlife habitats, which are outlined in that SWAP that could be supported by these different natural areas. So it wasn't just Dave Brinker and uh, a few of our folks at Wildlife and Heritage. We had worked with our colleagues in state parks and state forests, land acquisition and planning, our aquatic programs, and even the Maryland Geological Survey. So this was across the board, a large effort for a lot of Department of Natural Resources organizations. And so we essentially put together a framework of how to rank different sites, because obviously, Every individual had their own favorite sites and what we thought should be a natural area. So we put together this framework and essentially a way to score different areas based on different features. And through, oops, a little far. So through that process, we decided that we wanted to make it a voluntary recognition. So um, we didn't want to officially designate like other states. And uh, so we wanted to start it off as voluntary, just recognize some really cool places. And we wanted to recognize places that had exemplary natural features. So really cool geology, um, natural communities, which are the assemblages of plants and animals, spots where you could see rare, threatened, and endangered species in the state. So these were some of our selection criteria. We also wanted to make sure that these areas were sustainably managed because we didn't want to go through the whole process of designating natural areas and then having it get bulldozed over or turned into a parking lot. So we wanted to make sure they were going to be protected. And we wanted also to include more than just our own properties at the state level. We wanted to recognize significant county properties, significant federal properties and non-government organization properties as well. They just had to be um, have public access. So for our first cut of natural areas, all of them are public areas um, and they're available either for all or part of the year for people to go and visit. In some other states, they recognize both private and public natural areas, but we decided all public approach, at least for our first go around. And it took a lot of back and forth and scoring and ranking, and we came up with 31 areas for our first round of our natural areas map. And uh, one of the links that was shared with you, and we'll, we'll share it again throughout this presentation, is a link to this map. And you can actually click on these different dots, which represent the different natural areas, and find out a little bit more information about these sites. So if you were to click on one of those dots, you would actually be um, find our natural areas guide. It's both a web page and a downloadable PDF. And so this PDF uh, has its two pages for each of the sites. And essentially it talks a little bit about the history of the site and um, maybe why we featured it. So rare species that you might see, some things to watch out for if you're out there hiking like poison ivy and mosquitoes. Uh, we tried to include conservation information, so some natural information, as well as directions, how to get to the site and who's managing that site. So, uh, so we don't have an official guide that you can print all out together, but these are just 31 different PDFs that you can access through our website. And then the uh, website also has Google Maps links for all of the different locations, so you can plug it into Google and drive directly there. So let's get started on our journey throughout Maryland. And again, I said, we're going to start all the way in far Western Maryland to Cranesville Swamp, which is actually right on the border of Garrett County and uh, Terra Alta, West Virginia. So part of Cranesville is actually in West Virginia and part of it is in Maryland. We just had to include it anyways. And so I actually went to Cranesville Swamp um, two weeks ago when I was out camping in Western Maryland. And, and I should say that a lot of these sites that we picked for our first round are all places that biologists like myself, we like to go to experience nature. And the first time I went to Cranesville Swamp in, I was an undergraduate, I had fresh from Baltimore City, first time out in the mountains of Western Maryland. And then I walked out into this uh, 15,000 year old boreal peat bog. And you can see a picture of the boardwalk there. 
And it was just like that, a misty morning in the fall and just all the colors and the sights and the sounds. It was just amazing. And I felt like I was transported somewhere else. So this area is considered to be a frost pocket. So it almost has like a little bowl shape and it's colder than the surrounding area, which causes it to have a very short growing season. So the best time to visit Cranesville Swamp is between June and usually end of September, early October. The rest of the year, <laughs> it's really cold and a lot of things aren't green because it has that, that short growing season. But because it is so cold, it has a lot of species that you would experience up north, like larches, which are deciduous, um, deciduous conifers. So they're uh, essentially like a pine tree, but they lose their needles. And in September, they turn a brilliant yellow color and right before they drop all of their needles. You'll see lots of rare plants like bog, goldenrod. If you look really closely on the ground, you'll see these tiny little carnivorous plants called sundews, which have these little um, hairs that have sugars on them. And they attract insects that get stuck to them and then they eat them. And then there's another carnivorous plant called a pitcher plant, which was introduced to the swamp. So, uh, so you, can, you can see that there as well. There are wild cranberries, which are out in the swamp. And right now, if you're lucky, you'll still see a couple of those cranberries. A lot of the, uh, the animals have gotten to them already. So lots of cool stuff. Um, here, I'll show you a picture. This is what it looked like just recently. That's winterberry holly, so beautiful colors in the fall. And then this is that, that larch and how beautiful um, it turns in the fall. It's a state endangered species. So, uh, so that is uh, something you'll find. And, and one of the hikes through there is through a pine plantation. So you'll see different habitats. They're only a couple miles of hiking trails and they're not very hard to do. So the entire boardwalk through the bog is all um, a, you know, a wooden boardwalk. So it's a very easy walk there as well. And I see a question um, about plans to print the, um, the guide as one big unit. We don't have any current plans just because we don't have much of a publications budget, but we do provide a lot of these resources as downloadable PDFs that, um, that you can print on your own or download to your phones. Thank you. Uh, and this is the wild sound of a um, solid owl. And they are a migratory owl, which actually is migrating through Maryland right now. But Cranesville Swamp is one of the few places in Maryland where um, they actually breed. And I see a question from Kathy, is it buggy there? Surprisingly, it's not very buggy. So, uh, so that's uh, pretty, pretty helpful in that area. So I enjoy that, that I don't have to wear a lot of insecticides to visit. And I see a question from June, do most natural areas have hiking trails? And yes, most of them do have hiking trails. There are a few of them that I'll talk about that have uh, more water access, like Allen's Fresh. So we're going to move slightly eastward to Swallow Falls. Swallow Falls is great to combine with Cranesville Swamp. Um, so, uh, because they're only about 20, 30 minutes apart. Swallow Falls is a Maryland state park. And I forgot to mention Cranesville is managed by the Nature Conservancy. Swallow Falls contains um, Muddy Creek Falls, which is Maryland's largest waterfall. You can see it there. It looks gorgeous this time of year because there is a contrast between the green hemlocks, which are old growth hemlocks, and all of the orange and yellows from the maples and the birches that are turning colors this time of year. And we're just at the edge of peak season for, uh, for leaf change out in Garrett County. So um, these old growth hemlocks, some of them are two to 300 years old and really old species. Uh, there's been a lot of work with the Park Service to protect them from um, this invasive insect called the hemlock woolly adelgid. So they're doing a lot of work to help it out. There is a uh, wheelchair access to the top so you can see Muddy Creek Falls from a very easy walk. And then there's also a hike that you can do along Yakigain Ridge. It's not wheelchair accessible, but it's a decently easy hike to, to walk around on the side of the water there and see a few more of the, the waterfall features and, and rock formations. So neat animals that you can see out there include pine siskins, which down in this part of the state are uh, usually just a winter resident. So pine siskins are coming in. If you have um, 
If you have bird feeders, you might be lucky to catch some pine swiftkins this time of year if you're putting out little things like the Niger seed and all of that. So you can see them out in Swallow Falls year round. There's even a really neat um, subspecies of the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail called the Appalachian Tiger Swallowtail, which can be seen out there at Swallow Falls. And um, this is Swallow Falls itself. So it's much smaller, but still really pretty. And even things like the yellow-bellied sap suckers, which again are winter resident down our way here in Anne Arundel County, you can see them year round and they breed out there in, uh, in places like Swallow Falls. So I see a question about um, the access policy, policy for these sites and days, times and fees. Some of that information is included on the website, but because some of it changes, some of it is also linked as um, to the actual pages from the, for whoever manages the site. Like this one's linked for Maryland Park Service, so there is a fee to get out to Swallow Falls, but Cranesville Swamp is free to visit. Um, I'm not sure how tall that waterfall is, Helen. I used to have it written down, but I've forgotten it. So I'll have to look that up for you. Okay, so moving to Southern Garrett County, we have Lost Land Run. And this is about a seven, eight mile hike. It's not very um, up and down, which you get in a lot of Garrett County. It's pretty flat, but there are a lot of roots and rocks. So, uh, so you gotta have the ankles to be able to walk through it. And it also is a, uh, a cool site that you're gonna have to do a couple stream crossings. So there are little, there's some little bridges that go over Lost Land Run, but there are a few spots where you do have to walk across. I like to go to Lost Land Run in the springtime. May is the sweet spot for me because of all the amazing wildflowers that you can see. The wild geraniums, the fringe caligulas. This is painted trillium. This is actually past its peak. So uh, it looks even prettier than that. And you'll just see these large swaths of these trilliums right there along this beautiful mountain stream. This area is actually a, a, a conservation success story. And that's because Lost Land Run was suffering for years from acid mine drainage from a local abandoned mine that was draining into that, um, that run there. And it was causing the water to become so acidic that it wasn't able to support aquatic life like things like uh, trout and, and different insects and stuff like that. So, uh, so folks put up these lime dosers that actually release lime into the water to raise up the pH. And that helps um, keep that, that pH of the water balanced and also allowed for those brook trout, which are native trout species, and a lot of those other things to return to Lost Land Run. So it's really nice to see that kind of rebound. Uh, I just recently visited Lost Land Run two weeks ago and I went camping and in the fall, it's gorgeous as well. So it was still just as pretty with all the fall colors and, and all of that and lots of mushrooms to see. So I see some questions about um, if these are dog friendly. A lot of these places are dog friendly. Lost Land Run, um, you can bring dogs to Cranesville Swamp and, um, and Swallow Falls. So I'll, I'll let you know which ones aren't dog friendly. And uh, Lost Land Run is not a loop. It's just a one way in and out and you can park at either end. So, um, so there are two different access points for, uh, for Lost Land Run here. There are also some rare mammals. You can find Southern rock voles and long-tailed shrews if you're lucky. And they live in those rocky areas along the waterways. So, uh, so I was um, lucky enough to see a tiny little shrew run through, run by when I was getting ready to cross one of the streams. So, and I believe that you can fly fish at Lost Land Run, but again, you'll have to check out that website um, that from, it's part of the Potomac Garrett Forest, State Forest, so you'll have to look at their rules and, and regulations. So we're going to move eastward into Washington County and Cats Rock Bob's Hill. Um, this is a, a nice upward hike. <laughs> so if you want some aerobic workout and you don't want a very easy hike and you want to go uphill, go to Cat's Rock, Bob's Hill. So, uh, so there's my husband on the trail with Chucky the Project Wild Chicken several years ago. And we usually like to visit in the winter to, to get some of our winter blues away. And, um, and so you hike up in this really rocky area and you'll see a really nice um, deciduous forest. 
there's a really rare um, uh, wood rat. It's called the Allegheny wood rat. This is a federally listed species. He's just so adorable. They have a fully furred tail and they, uh, they live in these, um, in the rocky habitat that's found at Cat Rock and Bob's Hill. So this is caught Cat Rock, it's quartzite outcrop. So you can get up there and you can have a really nice view <clears throat> all around. Really cool lichens if you're into lichens that can be found up there. So those Allegheny wood rats live in those quartzite outcroppings. You usually won't see them because they live inside those rocks and are, are pretty shy. Um, if you're lucky, you might see a bobcat or a porcupine. So they, are, can, they can be found up there. And there's also a trail that loops around to um, Bob's Hill once you get up to Cat Rock and can keep going. And I have to admit, I've never made it to Bob's Hill myself. I've always made it up to Cat Rock and we're like, I've done this. And then I go back down and, uh, and I get distracted by all the cool lichens and mosses and little ericaceous plants, which are like the little blueberries and, and things like that that you can see along that trail. So this is also a really good view of the Blue Ridge Mountains here at Cat's Rock. <clears throat> so Soldier's Delight is a little bit closer. Um, this is actually a uh, area that's managed by our state parks. And it is a globally rare serpentine savanna in Owings Mills, Maryland, so out in Baltimore County. So to most people, this uh, might not look like a big, uh, a special site, but to biologists, this is a really awesome place because this serpentine savanna, there are less than 20 left in the entire world. 20 left in the entire world. And we have a fantastic example right in the middle of um, Owings Mills, Maryland. So the serpentine savanna is lined with this rocky material called serpentinite. It's high in magnesium and low in nutrients. And so it creates a very harsh environment for plants to grow in. So only those that are really, um, really adapted to live in that, that, um, that special environment can grow there. And because of this, we have over 25 rare threatened and endangered species that can be seen at Soldier's Delight including things like the serpentine chickweed and, um, and the different pollinators that, that feast upon it and things like that. So, um, so this area, my favorite time to visit is in the summertime because it is, that's when the grassland is at its, its peak and you can see what a natural grassland in Maryland looks like. So there are lots of wildflowers like this liatris, which is also known as blazing star. You'll see those purple um, fly, flags throughout the, the field with the tall grasses and things like that. You can bring dogs here. It's very important to stay on the trails at Soldier's Delight because the ecosystem is very fragile. So the other things to keep in mind with Soldier's Delight, as I said, it's great to visit in the summertime, but that, um, that rocky crust makes it really, really hot. And, um, and so it gets really hot. It's very buggy out there. So ticks, um, ticks are heavy at Soldier's Delight. So bring some sun protection. I usually suggest going out early in the morning and make sure that you wear your insecticides. So um, um, to enjoy that Soldier's Delight and stay on the trails. And um, when you can, when they're doing ranger led hikes and things like that, I highly suggest that so you can learn a little bit more about the history it used to be a chromium mine back in the day. And there were a group of concerned citizens that got together and saved it and created it, um, got it adopted into part of the state parks system. So, uh, so this is uh, how, how we've decided on um, Soldier's Delight and all of that. So I see some questions, are the trails well-marked? Um, and a lot of these areas, the trails are well-marked, but not all of them. And, uh, and also, you know, I see a question about the difference between natural areas and state parks. Natural areas is just a recognition of 31 sites across Maryland. So some of them include these state parks like Soldier's Delight, and some of them include um, uh, county properties and things like that. As far as uh, getting other natural areas um, at protected or declared as natural areas, we, uh, we haven't, haven't continued that on. A lot of this, uh, this project, unfortunately, has been put on hold. So, um, so I'll talk about that towards the end. 
And yes, porcupines do climb trees and Cat Rock is in Washington County. All right, so now we're going to go to one of my favorite places here in Anne Arundel County. And this is Jug Bay Wetlands Sanctuary. So, uh, so I love this place. I was just there um, the last two weekends in a row <laughs> because I, I take a lot of people out there to learn about nature. It is um, right along the Patuxent River. It's in Southern Anne Arundel County and this is managed by Anne Arundel County Parks. So it is not a dog friendly location and it costs $6 per vehicle to visit um, Jug Bay Wetland Sanctuary unless you are active military, which is free, and, or you're a member of their, um, their Friends of Jug Bay. So it's a beautiful wild rice marsh. It's great to visit year round. One of my favorite trails is the boardwalk, the marsh boardwalk, which is right by the visitor center. You go down a, a hill, it can be a little bit of a steep hill, so keep that in mind. But you go down the hill onto this wooden marsh boardwalk and you get to experience the marsh at the marsh level. So it's really, really cool to see all those plants. If you go there at low tide, you'll often see a lot of cool mammal prints and sign because they've got otters and beavers and muskrats and all sorts of things that are active there. So, uh, so it supports these really cute birds that uh, live off that wild rice, including these things called Sora rails. So they're really, they're tiny, um, tiny birds. You'll actually tend to hear them more than, than see them out there just because they, um, they're so good at blending in at the marsh, but they are actually stopping over at Jug Bay right now to feed on some of that wild rice to continue south. And they go as far south as Bermuda this time of year, which is amazing that something can travel that far. So um, it has excellent reptile and amphibian diversity. And this chunky guy right here is a marbled salamander, which is one of our bigger salamanders. They're about, you know, five to six inches long and they spend most of their time underground. But in early September, when we get those warm September rains, they all come up and they do um, this mass migration to these areas called vernal pools, which are temporary wetlands, and they lay their eggs in there. September, early September, it's really good time to, to see some of these. And sometimes they have night hikes where you can see the migration of the uh, marble salamanders there. The Jug Bay and along the Patuxent River is also one of the highest nesting locations for osprey in the United States, which is amazing that, that we have that um, here in Maryland. And this is one of the chicks that was banded by a senior naturalist, Greg Kearns, who works over across the way at Patuxent River Park, which is also part of our natural areas, um, natural areas. And, uh, and so, uh, so it's another spot to visit and that's over in Prince George's County. And I took that picture because I was on the banding trip with uh, the naturalist, Greg Kearns. So, um, so he was getting them out of the nest. He has all the licenses and permits to do that and putting little metal bands on their legs so we can track them. And, um, and so they've also started putting little um, radio tags on some of the birds. And we're getting some really interesting information from that as well. So moving, yeah, they, they, um, the soar rails will fly all the way down to Bermuda and they have a radio tracking tower down in Bermuda now. So really cool. So Potomac Gorge is over in Montgomery County. This is right on the, um, the border of Montgomery and Washington, DC. Um, and so you might know this is Great Falls. This is a national park. So, um, so there are over 60 rare, threatened, and endangered species. And this is a picture of Great Falls in the wintertime. And you can just see the mighty Potomac and how it really rushes down. So this area gets a lot of flash floods. Um, and so it has a lot of what we call scour areas. So it has that water, it scours all the rocks. And that really volatile environment is actually pretty good for some of these plants, rare plants to grow within. So, uh, so some of them like that, that um, area. So this area formed over 600 million years ago. And these rocks are uh, made of sand and silt. And um, one of my favorite spots in Potomac Gorge is uh, it's called the Billy Goat Trail. And you actually get to climb up on the rocks and walk right there along the Potomac. 
And so, uh, so this is a challenging hike. If you're looking for a challenging hike, this is um, a spot to go. If you can't do the challenging part, the Potomac Gorge runs um, along the uh, CNO Canal, which is flat and gravelly, so you can ride bikes and um, and you don't you're not going up and down hills and all of that. So uh, so that's a lot easier way to experience it if you don't want to do the Billy Goat Trail. So. There are um, really cool plants that are found here, including this Nantucket shadbush, which is quite rare. Um, and so it's found along the uh, Potomac Gorge. This is Curry Hyde, our former invasive species biologist with the Nantucket shadbush that's growing in there and that uh, um, rocky outcropping up there. I like to go to the Potomac Gorge in the springtime. And, uh, and that's because there's a tremendous amount of warblers, like the magnolia warbler, and yellow warbler, and all of that. They migrate through, and you can just hear this melody of songs um, in the treetops uh, as you're walking around. And there's huge swaths of wildflowers, the trilliums, the Virginia bluebells, and all sorts of other things that, um, that you can go to and see. So I see a question about billy goat being okay for kids. It depends um, on your kid's level of, of being able to climb. And there's one rock face that you do have to climb up their handholds. And it's not really vertical. It's more, it's like horizontal, but, um, but it can be a little challenging. So, uh, so there's some other trails near the Billy Goat Trail that are a little bit easier to, to walk on. So you can still see some of the, um, some of the sights and the sounds without um, going through all those rock layers. So good questions. So now we're gonna move south and we're gonna hit the Western shore of Maryland first. And we're going to go down to Battle Creek Cypress Swamp, which is the northernmost bald cypress swamp. It is a national natural landmark. And um, this area is managed by Calvert County and it's also owned by the Nature Conservancy. So this is a really cool place. When I walk in Battle Creek Cypress Swamp, it's like walking through the cypress glades of Georgia and Florida. It doesn't feel Feel like I'm in Maryland. So there are these really large old growth um, cypress trees and these are what are called the knobby knees or the nematophores which they use for gas exchange. So it's a tidal area and so the water rises and falls with the tides um, and, uh, and it does experience some flooding. So just recently they had some really terrible floods that knocked out part of the boardwalk. The boardwalk's a really easy walk but not all of it is open right now because some of it is for um, under repair. But you can still go there and experience these, um, these cypress trees. It's only, it's less than an hour in terms of, of walking around and, and walking the other trails. So, uh, so it's not, um, it's not very big, a very big site, but you can visit the American Chestnut Land Trust in Prince Frederick, which is nearby and has larger hiking trails. So I don't know if dogs are allowed here, but they are allowed at the American Chestnut Land Trust. Um, both of these areas are free to visit easy hikes. Um, Red Turtle Head at the end of September, if you walk along the boardwalk, you can actually see this wildflower as the state threatened, threatened wildflower. And this is another good spot to see um, reptiles and amphibians. So these great tree frogs um, can be seen and heard, uh, really you hear them a lot of times up in the trees. There's this rare cypress sphinx moth, and this is the caterpillar. You can find it there, and it feeds off of the, excuse me, the, the cypress trees. And one of the ways to survey for cypress sphinx moths and other night flying insects is essentially you take black lights and you stick them out on, um, on uh, white backgrounds like, like a bed sheet. And you put it up and you black light for insects and you see what insects are attracted to the light and fly on your sheet. So when I was first uh, in my DNR position and I went out there with our zoologist, um, invertebrate zoologist, Jennifer Selfridge, and we were black lighting to try to find this cypress sphinx moth. After hours, we got permission from the park to do it. And it was my first time ever doing black lighting. So we've got our lights up and we have headlamps on our heads and we hear this 
loud helicopter noise. And I was like, what is that? And then I looked over and I saw this thing flying at me. So this is a giant water bug and they are about two to four inches in length. So they really are big. And it was flying right at my head because I had my headlamp on and I definitely screamed. It was like that scene off of Jurassic Park, turn your light off, turn your light off. Cause we're trying to like frantically turn off our headlamps so this thing doesn't fly at our head. And I had never experienced one of these creatures beforehand. <laughs> they end up being really cool. Um, the males actually, they're a type of true bugs, so they're related to stink bugs. And the males carry the eggs on their backs and actually provide paternal care, which really doesn't happen with a lot of insects. Um, but, you know, when they're flying at your head, you don't appreciate <laughs> all of those qualities. They, um, they eat things like fish and frogs and, and small aquatic creatures that they find in the water. And they do have um, quite a bite from what I've heard. So another name for them is also known as toe biters. But I wasn't about to pick one up to find out. I gave it lots in, of space, <laughs> essentially. But it's a cool spot to visit. I was just there about a month ago and, um, and really pretty visit to, uh, to, to see. The, um, the cypress trees and just to experience that swamp. And I'm gonna play the, the sound of the gray tree frog really quick. They're much louder than that. That's actually a pretty, pretty low noise for them. Okay, so now we're gonna move down into Charles County to Allen's Fresh. And this is an area that's only accessible by kayak. So the parking spot is pretty small. Um, it doesn't have a kayak ramp, so you'll have to be able to, uh, to put your kayak in the water without a ramp. But this is a really beautiful spot to kayak and it's a really tranquil area. So you get to see the line between a tidal marsh and a non-tidal marsh as you go on up. It goes up into the Zakaya Swamp, which is a wonderful secluded spot in Charles County, and it goes all the way up to, uh, to Prince George's County. This is a bald eagle hotspot. If you want to see bald eagles nesting and things like that in an in area that feels just wild, um, that is Allen's Fresh. You can see really cool tidal plants as the, um, as the tide goes out. You'll see these little arrowheads, these rare arrowheads. And this little plant doesn't look like much. This is called um, water pygmy weed. It's like this big, so it's only about an inch or two tall. And it hadn't been seen in Maryland for over 40 years. And then a guy from the Smithsonian, Kevin Allen, went out and looked for it, and he rediscovered it. So, um, so that's Kathy McCarthy, the Eastern or Southern Region Ecologist for Maryland, and my former boss. That's her out there kayaking in Allen's French fresh and we got to go out and look for this plant for one day. So uh, so it's a really nice spot um, to, to visit and look for those tiny little plants in the mud flats. <laughs> you might see a rare plant in Maryland if you've got a good eye. But other than that, it's just a great spot to see birds. Um, you'll see a lot of wading birds like herons and egrets and things like that, bald eagles, ospreys, and, and it's also a really good spot for a lot of warblers. So this is in Charles County and, um, and you can have put in other water vessels like paddle boards and canoes, but I don't know if you can put any motorized vehicles in. It's um, because it, it's, it doesn't really have a spot to easily back up and, and put something in. So it's something you gotta kind of carry that kayak or canoe into. Okay. And we have directions on how to get there from the, uh, from on our website. Now we're going to go across the Chesapeake Bay over to the eastern shore and we're going to start with Fishing Bay. So this is a nice spot for, um, for folks who are confined to the car if you wanted to just drive around slowly and do some birding from the car. This is a good spot for that. It's tidal brackish marsh. They're also kayak accessible spots. And this is a birding hot spot. So, uh, so this is one of the few places in Maryland where the um, endangered black rail was last seen. So that's that little guy there in the middle of the screen. So wintertime's great to, to go and do some, some car birding at Fishing Bay because this time of year you'll see things like Northern Harriers and these daytime flying owls called short-eared owls that actually 
um, they bark like dogs. <laughs> you can find them out at Fishing Bay in, in the wintertime. So, uh, so it's a good spot to see different types of birds. And one thing I always suggest is, um, is going on a, a site called eBird, where people upload their sightings of birds. And you can go to eBird and look at where things have been seen recently, like the short-eared owls and the northern harriers before you take that drive over there. So I'm not sure about walking trails at Fishing Bay. I think it's mostly a drive around option because much of it is in Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. So a lot of it is that, that wetland refuge. So, um, so that's uh, something to keep in mind. And the small white flowered plant in Allen's Fresh was a type of arrowhead. I, um, uh, its name has changed and I can't remember its name off the top of my head, but I will look it up, so. So now we're going to go slightly north to Millington and Andover Flatwoods. These are two separate sites over in the western part of the east or eastern eastern shore. And um, so these are what are known as Carolina Bays. And so they are temporary wetlands over on the eastern shore, kind of like vernal pools, but um, they're a special type of vernal pool. And, and so they um, dry up in the summertime. And, um, and because of that, they can't support fish because they don't have water year round. So since they have water in the spring and the winter, it's an amphibian breeding hotspot. And you'll find all sorts of cool amphibians there like barking tree frogs, which are endangered in Maryland, and carpenter frogs, which are uncommon in Maryland, and these chorus frogs, which I'll play a sound of in a second. So, um, so it's um, area, there are a lot of mosquitoes because it is this, this wetland type area. It's got some cool plants. Um, this is called feather foil. And this is an aquatic plant. It's a winter germinator. So this time of year, it's actually germinating. And when it fills up with water, those fan shaped leaves allow it to float on the surface. And this is actually in the primrose family. If you can believe that it's related to primroses, for those of you that garden, <laughs> it looks nothing like it to me. But, uh, but it is a, a relative and it has these weird inflated strip stems that, that are on these, um, these floating leaves. So, uh, so this is a spot to visit to see some of those cool plants, unique plants, and um, to hear some of these species. And I'm going to play you the sound of the chorus frog. It kind of sounds like um, somebody's running their finger over the top of a comb. Hear that? And you can hear the peeper in the background too. No, there are not boardwalks at Millington and Andover Flatwoods, so it's a uh, um, you'll need some some boots, waterproof boots, or should should um, you know be okay with with having your feet get a little wet because it does get really wet and soupy on the trails there. So now we're going to go uh, over to Skimmer Island, and Skimmer Island. This is the bridge to Ocean City, and this sand spit right here is Skimmer Island. So it might not look much to you, and you've probably driven past it if you've gone to Ocean City over the bridge without realizing that this is a special site for a lot of breeding birds. So um, we have different types of birds called colonial water birds, and they essentially like to, um, to nest together in these really large bunches. And um, some of it's for protection. Essentially, they can alert each other in the colony. So this area is viewable from, um, from Ocean City. And you can go along the edges here. And, and sometimes you can view it safely from the bridge. Um, it's closed to, to people during the breeding season. So when these birds are active and out there, you can't go there. But in the wintertime, like right now, um, fall and winter, you can visit the Sandspit Island. So um, this is one of those cool birds that, that would nest there. This is a um, black skimmer. It's a state endangered species. And it has this um, larger lower bill. And it essentially takes it and skims the water to catch things like fish to feed its fluffy little chicks that you can see there. Other birds that nest there include these royal terns. And I'll show you a quick video in the next slide of how noisy they are and how many you can see. But they all like to nest together. And they like these sand spit islands because it keeps them away from, um, from 
predators on land like raccoons and foxes. So that, that little sandy spit in the middle of the channel keeps them um, protected from a lot of those species that would eat them and their babies. Unfortunately, these are areas that, you know, are, are changed a lot. Um, that sand erodes over time, just how the island was made, it erodes away. And so um, we don't really have those new sources that are dumping sand to those places like we used to. And so, uh, so this is a spot where Dave Brinker, who is the mastermind for Maryland Natural Areas Program, he worked with the Army Corps of Engineers and a local harbor that took dredge spoils from the harbor and actually replenished the sand spit island to, um, to help recreate Skimmers Island and bring back some of that sand that was lost to allow for those birds to breed there. And also horseshoe crabs, there's a horseshoe crab breeding frenzy in the, uh, it's towards the end of May. And you can go to places like uh, along Ocean City and Delaware and see hundreds and thousands of these horseshoe crabs all breeding at once. And you'll see this special little bird called the red knot, which feeds on those eggs. So really cool sight and all of that to see and, and everything. So this is a video of those royal terns. You can see all those eggs and just listen to all the noise they make. So that's what it's like if you were to actually visit it in the summertime, which it's not allowed to visit. Um, there was a GoPro camera that was set up by Dave Brinker and it was for one of his research studies um, to, to look out there. But, uh, but you can drive by with boats, drive by slow because boat wakes can, um, can hurt the island and, and can cause some, some um, waves and stuff like that. And uh, again, you can view it from the edges of Ocean City if you've got some good binoculars or a spotting scope. So the north end of Assateague Island is another great birding spot. And actually, it's a really good birding spot in, um, in winter. So the north end of Assateague is Assateague State Park. Um, Assateague Island is mostly the national seashore. But uh, right there by Ocean City um, on the tip of the barrier island is a good spot in the winter to see things like seals. So this is a harp seal that visited several years ago in 2014. You'll see a ton of different ducks and other types of waterfowl there. And if you're lucky, some years we have snowy owls that come down south from Canada and they actually will spend the winter at the northeast, uh, north end of Assateague Island. So this was a snowy owl that was captured as part of a, um, of a research study for Project, um, Project Snowstorm. You can look it up. And so you can see this little V. She actually is wearing a GPS backpack that's tracking her locations. This is Monocacy. She's a female owl. And, um, and she was banded as part of that, that research effort. But, um, but she and others have been seen at Assateague Island in the wintertime. And these, much like those short-eared owls, are owls that you can see hunting during the day. But keep in mind, um, with owls and ethics and seals and all of that, you should keep a respectable distance from those animals. Um, actually, seals are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, so you do have to keep a certain distance away legally to um, protect them and, uh, and just give them their space so you can view them from a safe distance. Oh, and you might see portions of Assateague Island that are closed due to the nesting piping plovers, which are a federally listed species. And don't they look like little cotton balls on toothpick legs? They're so, so cute. So, so um, as far as endangered species, so a species can be listed at the state level as endangered, threatened, or rare, and they can also be listed at the federal level as endangered, threatened, or rare. So they come with different levels of protections and regulations and all of that. So, um, and excuse me, the north end of um, the island, that really, it's part of the island, so you really um, can't get to it by boat. It's more, it's walking and, and you can pull up with your car and, and bird essentially from right by the parking lot. So, um, so you can use that there. 
Now, Green Run Woods is all the way at the south end of the island. And this is one you either have to walk to um, or uh, you have to take like uh, an off-road vehicle if you get one of those permits. I've never been down to Green Run Woods myself, but it is an old growth maritime forest. And even though it's old growth, some of these plants are only uh, a couple inches in diameter because it's such a tough environment for them to, uh, to grow in. You'll see some plants like beech plum, which is a state endangered plant. It grows along the coast. It used to be found all over Ocean City until a lot of those um, hotels and houses were built there. But you can still find it on the island and it's a much more common plant as you go up north. So this is an example of a species that's endangered in Maryland but up north along the coast it's really common and it's not listed as a rare species. And apparently you can eat those plums but I've never tried them um, just because it's it's such a rare plant. So there is a brown headed nuthatch which can be seen there in the fall and the winter and it has a different type of noise and I'll play that really quick. That's what he looks like. So uh, different type of nut hatch that you can see. And um, it's also a spot in the wintertime that solid owls, um, the little migratory owls, they will um, pass through and sometimes hang out near that area in, in the winter. So the future of natural areas, I know some people are asking about how to get different sites um, designated. And we have quite a few sites that are, um, are on like our backup list. So this is a really big project. Like you said, there were multiple state agencies that were working on it. And uh, we just haven't had the time and the funding to continue with this project, but we'd love to one day when, when the time is right. We also would like to create some interactive maps, essentially that people could go to and, and use on like a phone, you know? So there are interactive PDFs and things like that out there. Um, but mainly what we're focusing on is getting the word out and also working with the land management agencies to have continued management. So areas like um, Soldiers Delight, they need these things called prescribed burns, which are essentially controlled fires to help cycle the nutrients and setbacks, succession and things like that. So we use that to keep that area as natural as possible and uh, to replicate some of the processes that would have occurred before the Europeans and all of us built up all around these, these areas. So, um, so something to keep in mind, that's our big, big focus is that continued management and making sure. And one day, maybe we'll be able to add a few more sites to our list. So um, with that, I will take any additional questions that you might have. Um, and there's the link. We'll also share that again in the chat so you can go to our map. So check out our Maryland natural areas and I hope you get a chance to visit a few of them and let me know if you visit any and send me some photos. So, uh, so I'd love to see it. And please check out our other programs. So we have um, other webinars that we're providing through our Wild Acres Backyard Wildlife Habitat Program. So you have one on bats that's coming up to, uh, if you wanna learn about bats next week. And uh, we have a lot of other wildlife education resources. So we'll also share those in the chat for you. So I see a few questions um, as far as geocaching allowed in all the natural areas. Geocaching is allowed on certain uh, spots. And again, um, these natural areas, natural areas is just a designation. It's not a, um, uh, you know, a, a protection or anything like that. So some of the parks allow for geocaching, but some of them um, like, like um, some of the nature conservancy properties are managed by different agencies, so they might not allow it. So it would be a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and so Green Run Woods is part of Assateague. I see that question there. And um, as far as supporting work to expand these areas, that's a really good question. And one of our biggest, um, biggest issues is funding and, and staff. So, uh, so we just don't have... The, uh, the funding to do some of that education side like we used to. But we're hoping that within the next year, we'll be able to, um, to increase our education staff and at least have one more person come on temporarily. So yes. 
Um, geocaching is where people put hide things outside and um, and they other people have to find it looking for GPS using the GPS coordinates like the latitude and the longitude. So um, so it's a fun process to go out and find different things and all of that. And yes, you will be able to share this presentation. So feel free to share. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and so, uh, so yes, you can uh, share this along. As far as wilderness and natural areas, so natural areas are um, a voluntary designation and it's just spots that we essentially decided were really cool to visit and had unique natural features. So wilderness areas, some of the wilderness areas are actually a legal um, definition and, and protection for certain properties in Maryland. So it, it's a little different than the natural areas designation. Um, I see a question from Miriam about Project Wild, which is a professional development that I'll be leading. And um, it is for anybody who would like to join in. So parents and homeschoolers can, uh, uh, adults can attend. So um, it is a program where I teach you how to use different lesson plans and things like that to teach about wildlife. So, so I've got Project Wild coming up, um, starts next week. I've got two sessions for Project Wild and then I have Growing Up Wild, which is an early childhood program for um, pre-K through second grade educators, so. Um, as far as masks, um, most of these areas do have, we're all about mask it up Maryland. So, um, so we do like to have people wearing masks out in these natural areas to protect themselves and others. So the bat presentation will be next Thursday, um, 7 to 8.30 PM. And, um, and that is, um, that will be on Zoom. And um, registration's almost full, so sign up early. So yes. And as far as helping to band birds, so um, so you can volunteer with certain organizations. Right now, a lot of places are not accepting volunteers due to COVID. So for example, at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, AKA CERC here in Anne Arundel County, we have the Solid Owl Bird Brand Banding Project as a volunteer project um, that people can sign up for. But um, this year we're not accepting volunteers because of, of COVID. So, um, so check out CERC um, and that's a local spot to help with bird banding. And uh, you can learn more about it there. So I see a question, um, what about Mallows Bay and Nanjimoy are under consideration for future designation? So um, I, I think Nanjimoy is under consideration. It used to have the largest nesting colony of great blue herons in the, um, in the Northeast and um, they've moved on, but, um, but you know, Nanjimoy is still a very special spot. And Mallows Bay was probably um, probably part of the natural areas too, especially because of the, the natural history with the, now that it's a national marine sanctuary too. So that designation has happened. And unfortunately, you know, with our natural areas, it's voluntary. So it's just a recognition. It's not a legal protection for these different spots. So. And I will pull up my link to the bat so um, so you can find out how to, to join us and join in for our bat presentation. So if you sign up for our Habitat newsletter on our Wild Acre site, you can get our notifications for our public events, our webinars that we are offering through the Department of Natural Resources. So I'm going to put that link in the chat to um, find out about our um, two programs. We've got bats and then I've got snakes that I'll be doing for Meadowside Nature Center. So you can use that to sign up for the bat program. Yes, CERC is open for walking, but it's not open to have people after hours um, without a badge to do the bird banding. So, um, so yeah, we don't, um, we can't accept volunteers that don't have CERC badges this year, sorry. And scouts. Um, so sometimes I do scout presentations and I also, um, because I'm one person and I work statewide, <laughs> I have a lot of resources online too for, um, for using with scouts. I'm working on spider activity book that I hope will uh, be out this week and up on our wildlife education page. So I hope that will be there. And this presentation is being recorded. It will be up on the YouTube channel for Anne Arundel 
County Public Library. Um, so, uh, so they'll send out that notification. All right, well, thank you all for joining me. Yes, I will provide the education link for our wildlife education resources. If you go to that page um, under at home learn or learn at home, you will see our spider book when I put it up this week. So check out our, <laughs> I sleep sometimes. <laughs> Thank you all, and I hope you have a fantastic week. And check out our natural areas. It's going to be a beautiful weekend, so perfect time to go and visit these different natural areas.